We're here with my friend Casey Reaver from Maria Montessori Academy. I wanted to talk with Casey and share her wisdom with you for a lot of reasons, including because I know she has so much to offer that can help you, but also because she has a very unique role in her school. And I believe this is a role can, that can be part of the success of other schools, particularly large Montessori schools. So Casey, tell us a little bit about Maria Montessori Academy and just to help us understand that community and how you help with their needs. Okay. Um, Maria Montessori Academy is a charter school in Ogden, Utah. Um, we have 650 students, uh, preschool through ninth grade. Uh, we have about 75 staff members um, and we are in our sixth year of operation. Um, my role is the curriculum instructional specialist and um, I guess what that means is basically I'm a curriculum director and an instructional coach kind of tied up into one. Um, my role is an administrative one. Um, and so I really just help support the teachers and make sure that they are um, happy and, and on track to, to helping their students be successful through Montessori. Now, my understanding is that even though you are an administrator, you are um, kind of a, a colleague peer as well in that the teachers can be comfortable with you. You're not giving their evaluations, you know, changing their salary. Is, am I understanding that correctly? That's correct. I, I do. Um, we have a great relationship, the teachers and I do. Um, and I feel like they are comfortable coming to me with questions, concerns, uh, comments, suggestions, any of that. Uh, I do play a part in their evaluations though, and so that is um, one of the, the tricky lines to balance. Of course. Well, and, and you are fortunate. From my perspective anyway, you have a wonderful director at your school, and so there is a, a sense of community, a sense of everyone working together to, to make things better for the children and for the entire school community. So you're very fortunate there, but I think one of the things about your role that is a little bit unique is that you're not just an administrator, that, right. that there's a little bit more of that there. Tell us a little bit about MEPI, what it is, and what your role is there, just to give a little bit more of your perspective. Right. Uh, MEPI is Montessori Education Programs International, and I am on the board of directors for MEPI. Uh, it's, it's, you know, there's AMS and there's AMI and there's MEPI and there's um, IMC and there's all of these <laughs> wonderful acronyms. Um, MEPI is just one of the, the, the small Montessori organizations that help support teacher training programs. Um, you know, through through their guidance and wis wisdom. So, and as I understand it, it one of the reasons that that MEPI is well respected, even though it's may be not as well known as AMS and AMI, is because they have taken the step to connect with MACT, the Teacher Accreditation Organization. Right. That's absolutely right. Yes, MEPI is MACT accredited, and um, they work really hard to make sure that Mon their Montessori programs are fully implemented. So, so Casey, now that, that we understand a little bit about your perspective, tell us what you feel are some of the challenges facing Montessori educators today, particularly public school Montessori educators. Well, you know, I think it always just comes back to that training piece um, to, to get good quality educators that can, that can be successful in a large environment. Um, like a charter school or a public school, you you obviously have to have that state licensure, and a lot of the knowledge that comes along with that, as far as you know, that comes along in traditional education programs. Um, but then you also, it's essential to be Montessori trained, and so um, that's a lot of work. Montessori training in and of itself is huge, um, and then traditional education training in and of itself is huge. And when you put them to the two of them together, it's just kind of a gigantic. Uh, endeavor. Uh, one that I think is, is hugely, hugely essential to the success of a Montessori school. But I think that there can definitely be some growth um, in the training programs in combining the two so that they're not um, reiterating the same kinds of things because really Montessori is just best practice. Um, and you know, I, I have my bachelor's in early childhood and elementary education from a traditional uh, university and um, I tell people all the time that I learned at the university how children learn best and how to teach them best and then it was only then when I went into the traditional education realm that I was told you can't teach that way um, it's not it's just not realistic. This is the real world. We have a test to take. So, well, and I was I was telling your story because I, I've heard you talk about how you came to Maria Montessori mm -hmm. Academy. 
tell us a little bit about what you think some of the organizations are doing to, to lessen this burden, to maybe make it a little bit easier for teachers to be trained adequately but not be overburdened. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I know that, you know, for example, here uh, at Westminster, they've got the uh, Montessori program where after three years you can have your, te your teacher licensure, uh, your Montessori certificate, and then with a few extra classes you can have your master's degree. So I know that those kinds of programs are starting to pop up. Um, the Teach Montessori movement that's kind of happening right now is pretty big just kind of recruiting teachers to then be well recruiting people to become Montessori teachers versus recruiting teachers who are already trained that to then switch pedagogy and become Montessori teachers sure, so sure yeah. well Casey in your role at Maria Montessori Academy you have learned over the the period of time you've been in that position a little bit that maybe you could share with someone taking that same role at another school are there things you would suggest to them even if it's the director because she's having to kind of yeah. carry your role too are there things you would suggest for someone taking on your role in another school how they can be successful um, I have read so many books this year it's been a huge learning curve I would say go to Amazon and just type in instructional coaching um, that's been the biggest thing for me to switch from being a classroom teacher to an instructional coach and while it's kind of a very similar um, bag of tricks there there are certain ways that you deal with adults that you wouldn't necessarily deal with children and, and not being able to be their support all the time yes. and kind of allowing them to you know find their own way but then giving them every the feedback that they need to become successful um, I think you know just realizing that um, your role will change you know, if, if you are in the classroom and then you decide to leave the classroom and go into this curriculum role, um, it is, it's wonderful. It is really wonderful, but you don't get to be with the children every day. So that's, it's kind of a, an adjustment period. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and it sounds like part of, of the challenge here is to be a coach, to be someone who pulls out the skills from the person who is it's you're not just teaching them how to do everything you're you're having to identify where they're succeeding where they're not and then then let them kind of run the show where you're that support to them is that correct yeah, part of what I'm hearing there's a lot of reflective questioning and listening and and really you know everybody wants to do the best job that they possibly can absolutely and, um, so well, and, and I just have to say that is one of the reasons I wanted to interview Casey because I personally feel that is one of the keys in the role that she has. When you believe people are doing their best, they're bringing to bear all the skills that they can, I think that brings out the best in them. And so I am pretty sure that Casey is doing that at her school. Casey, would you have any suggestions for administrators? Maybe, like I said, I know you have a wonderful director, but perhaps you've heard or seen other things that, that there are things that directors could do to make classroom lead educators lives a little bit easier um, you know I really do believe wholeheartedly in this position the curriculum instructional coach or specialist or whatever you want to call it um, I think that especially for large schools it's huge I think it's necessary I would say that um, I hope within my school it, there becomes a time where this position is not an administrative one because that's kind of a tricky situation to walk where you're supporting but also evaluating. Um, I would I would rather just be the support and know that and so my teachers know that I'm a hundred percent on their side while still supporting the mission of the school. Um, but you know for right now that's just not a reality. Um, but I think you know the biggest thing is if, if administrators um, are not Montessori trained they need to have a Montessori heart and um, and I think that really that's what the success of a school really uh, balances on yes I absolutely agree with you are there things you would suggest to parents whose children are in a Montessori school things that they could do to help them have the best experience um, you know, I think there's a difference between um, a private Montessori parent and a public or a charter Montessori parent. I think private Montessori, because you're investing so much of your uh, financial resources, you definitely know what you're signing on for. I think that if you are a public or a charter Montessori parent, there are times um, when you just feel like here's the fix it because every, nothing else has worked. And, and, and it can be. Uh, 
if parents know what they're getting into. Um, and, you know, that's not to scare parents away or anything. It's just we really believe in that school to home partnership and, and, and really bridging that gap so that the child can be fully normalized and fully implemented in this Montessori environment. So I would say to parents, there's so many resources out there. If you just read up, um, talk to people, really understand what Montessori is and um, get behind your teachers and your administrators. And I know that all of them are more than willing to have those kinds of conversations with um, parents in order to help educate them. So Casey, it sounds like you're saying that parents need to use the resources at the school. So if they don't understand Montessori, they need to talk to the people at the school. But it also sounds like you're saying if they've come to Montessori because something else wasn't working, they need to understand their role in making Montessori a success for their own children. Correct. Absolutely. Yes. Well, let's talk about things a little more controversial. Okay. Standardized testing. Yes. Um, uh, those who have watched our show for a while probably know that testing is not standardized testing. You know, you get a grade, you get a ranking is, is not part of the Montessori way of doing things. But mm -hmm. in our public Montessori schools, this is a, a fact of life. Mm -hmm. Tell us how you have made this less burdensome or worked with the system. Anything you would suggest that people in this position could do mm -hmm. to succeed? Well, you know, I really, I, I hope that um, it isn't just public or charter Montessori schools that are providing these kinds of real life practical experiences for students. You know, I hear of private schools all the time who are standardized testing their, their students just in order to help prepare them for the future. Um, I also think it's huge um, to be able to demonstrate to your parents, to the public, to the teachers, where the strengths and weaknesses are um, on an, in a norm-based system. Um, I think that definitely, you know, there is that balancing act where you can become, you know, too test-heavy, too test-centered. But really, if you understand what's going to be on the test, you can naturally integrate that into any of your lessons all the time um, to make it less, you know, troubling for the students. So it sounds so. like understanding the test is a big part of it, that, mm -hmm. that you kind of get rid of the fear, get rid of the pushing away, and learn it mm -hmm. so that you can then incorporate it into your normal Montessori practice. Absolutely. It's nothing to be afraid of, I don't think. And Common Core Standards. Utah has a version of those. Many of the, the organizations that, that we will uh, be helping are under that. What what's, have you done to help incorporate that into Montessori or succeed with that requirement? You know, I actually really like the Common Core Standards. Um, I think it's a set of standards that children, the majority of children, ought to be able to um, make by the end of their cycle. Um, I think it's great that, you know, my child could move to New York and still be on the same page and not be grade levels behind. I really, I think the Common Core Standards are a good thing, um, but again, it comes down to understanding them and not being terrified by them and not allowing them to drive your practice. Because really, you know, we all know that Montessori goes above and beyond the Common Core Standards anyway. Um, but it is nice to have that baseline because even within, you know, different organizations or different training programs, there's a different sequence and um, kind of just having that expectation that you know in third grade a child ought to be able to multiply and divide and just knowing that so that even when our first graders are doing it we're okay. Well the last question I'm going to ask you before I give you a chance to just share anything that you would like to is what do you think about this opt-out movement where some parents in charter schools public schools are saying don't test my child I don't think this is a good practice. Yeah. You know, personally, I'm on the fence with that. Uh, I have my own three children to think about, and I've seriously considered it. Um, I think it boils down to, yes, they won't have to take the test, but then they'll still be subject to the instruction that happens to prepare all of the other students for the test. So um, I think parents have to do what's best for their children. Um, I think that if if people are going to opt out, they need to understand what that really means and how that affects the instruction that their children are still going to receive. 
And so. I, 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 I think you brought up some wonderful points here, Casey, and I think they also need to find out how it will affect their school. Mm -hmm. If they're in a public school, this is something that's still policy and process, so right. I encourage them to talk to their administrators mm -hmm. maybe about what that would, would do to the larger school community. Mm -hmm. So is there anything else you'd like to share with us? You've had some wonderful experience, and, and so anything else that would just help other Montessorians succeed? Um, just, I think the biggest thing is just trust the method, and it, it works. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Casey. Thank you. As you prepare to teach the zoology curriculum in the Montessori classroom, whether primary, three to six-year-old children, or elementary, it's important to keep a few different things in mind. First is, especially if you are in a public school setting or you have a uh, a school in a community that is not well established with appreciating Montessori, so you have a lot of new students at the beginning of the year, you're going to have children at all different levels of knowledge. So it's going to be important that as you plan out the work for them, that you recognize there's a different level of knowledge about zoology, about dinosaurs, the, the timeline of life uh, that's part of the Montessori curriculum. And there also will be different levels of skills in being able to work independently. When I was teaching in a lower elementary classroom uh, recently, I presented the timeline of life. And if you're not familiar with this, it is the timeline that kind of follows from the earliest life in the ocean on up through to early humans and to, to modern humans and, and basically the, the state of uh, animal life and plant life on the earth today. And the way that this is, there's different ways that this is presented, but, but one part of the presentation is to have a large timeline that either has photos or objects or sometimes even a combination of the two that the children can lay out on the time frame when that creature was on the earth. So, for instance, trilobites are a, a, a prehistoric arthropod that existed in many different forms. They evolved and changed over time, and they existed in many different forms in different times. So if a child were putting pictures or actual trilobite fossils, if you're fortunate enough to have those, on the timeline, they might go different places um, in it. Obviously, some of the, the animals like modern insects and things that would be on there would be placed near near the present time. So one of the ways that this can be presented is that you talk about the story of the coming of life and you lay out some or all of the uh, different animals and plants out on the timeline as you tell the story of how they came to be on the earth. And then the follow-up work for the students is to take that same timeline take those pictures and or those objects and lay them out for themselves so that they are then being able to internalize that knowledge a little bit. And one of the things that I found was that some of the students that I had who had several years in the Montessori classroom had developed, whether in the Montessori classroom or somewhere else, uh, a strong sense of self-initiative and, and had learned how to follow through on a kind of a complicated project that required them to do a lot of thinking, maybe do some checking with, with another resource, that they were able to do that follow-up work pretty successfully. But there are other children in the class who were just as interested in the dinosaurs, just as interested in the trilobites and things like that, and they, they couldn't do that without a lot of assistance from me. And so one of the things that I did is I took some things that I had and created a work at the level that they could do. Now, the other piece of, of this segment is going to be about giving students as much experience with real materials as possible. And if you don't have the real thing, then use a good model. If you don't have a good model, then use a good illustration or photograph. And only after the child is ready for that level of abstraction of using only words, would you go to, to just using words. So what I did is I actually had some cards that I made from some images from 
many years ago that I was going to use on a timeline of life eventually, but I never ended up making the timeline of life for them. So I had cards of prehistoric animals of of some of the creatures that belong on a timeline of life, and I just had them set out as cards. So I created two different works that those children who really could weren't up to assembling a timeline of life without a lot of help were able to do. And one of the things that I had them do was take some little models that I have. Some of you are probably very familiar with the um, Safari limited models and, and they do quite a bit with prehistoric things at this point. They have models of the actual prehistoric animals and I had the students match those up. For some of them, I didn't have a model of the animal. I had a model of the skull and a picture of the animal. So they were then able to match those up. And the other piece of work that I put together and I intended to make nice, beautiful cards and <laughs> didn't manage to do so, was I had them sort into the vertebrates and the invertebrates. And some of the students that I had, even six and seven year olds, had not yet been exposed to the idea that invertebrates were animals that have no backbone or and no bones, basically. And so these are the, the cards that I just made on the spur of the moment during lunch one day so that they had some work that they could do in the area that we were working with the things that were interesting to them, the models and the photos of, of these creatures. And so this was one way that I met those students where they were and gave them follow-up work that was appropriate for them. Now I'm going to show you just a few other real um, things or models. Uh, this happens to be a model that I bought at a, a, a rock store. It was something that the, the man who owned the store got from a local uh, university department that they were getting rid of. It's to show how fossils are formed. So this is a model of a fossil that forms in the mud and then, then the, the, it, the, the rock hardens and, and you have the impression of the animal. This is the fossil animal in that it is the animal itself whose tissue was replaced, but it's the shell of the animal. And then this shows how the inside of the soft tissue of a mollusk can create a, a fossil. So these are examples of things that are either real or are models of real objects that you can share with the children. Now, sea creatures are actually a little bit easier than some things to have the real thing. This is a real dead sponge. This is the real shell of, of a mollusk. And so when you have these things in the classroom, they're going to naturally tend to attract the, the students. For things like a jellyfish or an octopus on the timeline of life, having real models for them to, excuse me, having 3D models for them to lay out is, is a great way to, to bring their interest to bear. Now, anytime that you are drawing the children into something in the classroom, you do need to, to take, take it a little bit further. And you need to think about what is the next step? If they're just going to take the objects to their rug and play with them, that's not what you're looking for. You need to have some activity for them to do that has a purpose, has a completion point, such as the sorting exercise that I just described of sorting the animal cards into vertebrates and invertebrates. Now, even though for familiar animals that is an exercise for very young children, it's a very appropriate exercise for elementary students with animals that they are just learning about. Now I'm going to show a couple of other things that can kind of bring some interest to bear and talk about how then you could use those as a way to draw the students into purposeful work, especially research. So uh, one of the reasons that I'm doing this segment at this time is that, that some of you who are seeing it may be on a break. You may be taking vacations. You may be shopping at the stores, at national parks or recreation areas. And 
finding things that are designed to uh, engage children with wildlife and adults, and that is what this is. This is um, a flip book about the wolf. So I'm going to actually flip it and see how well I can do this and talk at the same time. But as you, as the book is flipped through, it looks like the wolves are running towards you. And you've probably seen something like this. Then across from that, on this side of the book, are animal facts. Gray wolves are the largest of the canids, the Canis lupus species. The female wolf digs a den in which she gives birth and raises her pups. So there's some good information here that would actually help the students then start into some research. Even if all that they're doing is a bullet list of facts about the wolf, they could do that with the help of this book. Um, here's another example with the bear. Now, I was first exposed to these books a long time ago, and they were just an illustration. So here, the only thing it is, is the life cycle of the butterfly. There's not even any words at all in the book. I'll do that one more time because it's kind of fun. I don't know whether these are still in existence. And the other side of the book is the life cycle of a dandelion. So with these books, you would need to make sure that you had something in the classroom for the children to then extend their research, for them to do that next step so that you were helping them not just to be entertained or have their interest grabbed briefly, but that you're drawing them into purposeful work that you want them to do in the classroom. So as you look for things to bring into your classroom that are interesting to you, that you believe would be interesting to your students and would be very much in alignment with the Montessori principle of attracting students into work, keep in mind that final goal. Keep in mind that we're looking for sustained concentration. We're looking for staying focused on purposeful work long enough for that transformation of the personality to happen. Yes, we want them to learn about wolves and the prehistoric creatures and all those other wonderful pieces of information that are part of our curriculum, but that's not the main goal. The main goal is that they become people who learn and contribute from that place of understanding. That is our goal in Montessori education. Not that long ago, I was in the position of taking over the, the responsibility for being the lead educator in an upper elementary Montessori classroom in a public school, a charter public school. And it was a huge responsibility. I found that it challenged me on several different levels. I had a lot of Montessori background. I had taught older children within a, an elementary classroom that mostly included younger children, but that was my first time teaching children from age 9 to 12 and being responsible for the Montessori curriculum for children who would be the equivalent of 4th, 5th, and 6th graders in the United States. Not only was I responsible for teaching them the Montessori curriculum, but I was also responsible for the state standards for this school where I was teaching because that's the nature of teaching Montessori in a public school. And I found myself completely overwhelmed. If it wasn't parent communication or a behavioral challenge in the classroom or not knowing how to keep track of the progress on all of those state standards for which I was responsible, making sure the children made progress. It was just the whole situation of that new routine. I have found that if you do everything for someone, it's not a good thing. They don't learn very well, but I've also found that if you expect someone to do more than they can possibly do in the hours that they have available, they are definitely not going to succeed nor serve the children in the best way. So I have created something that I am calling a Montessori co-op, uh, a co-op for consulting that allows those schools that have educators starting out or who are very new to the Montessori classroom to have some of those responsibilities done for them and to have a way to check in 
a way to have observations done by an experienced Montessori educator who can give them good feedback and help them learn how to find the solutions that they need. If you are looking for parent newsletters, lesson plans, correlation from the Montessori curriculum to the Common Core State Standards of the United States, this is something that I can help you with. Our cooperative can allow you for a very reasonable amount of money to have some of these things done for your, your teachers. Allow them to be at their best. Allow them to learn from where they're starting. Uh, meet them where they are. Let them have Montessori education be as joyful an experience as you are seeking to provide for the students in your school. If we can help you, we are happy to be that resource that lets your students and your teachers make the most of the coming school year.